in all the countries that were occupied by Axis forces, resistance movements have been formed to harass the invaders. In July 1940, Britain had formed the Special Operations Executive, who were instructed to set Europe ablaze by supporting these resistance fighters and conducting their own sabotage and espionage missions. The responsibility of transporting SOE's agents and equipment to occupied Europe was assigned to special duties squadrons of the RAF. You were given a map reference and you had to study that map reference very carefully. And um, we never tried to find out how our passengers were. And they didn't try and find out who we were. There was no communication. The reason being is if we got shot down or if either of us got taken prisoners, you couldn't, you couldn't tell them about the other ones. All right, because the SA people were considered to be a different category from what even what we were, and we were a different category from them entirely, and we were a different category from normal air crew. And even the, that was known in Germany. There was one time when we were delivering uh, stuff to the Maquis. Now the Maquis is different from the SOE. Maquis is the French. So what we were doing, we were delivering uh, those guns and ammunition that was a full load in the Hudson. Now the Hudson was an American aircraft that was designed to, to land in the prairies. Uh, not naturally on, on good tarmac runways, but anywhere where a farmer would put up a windsock. That's what they were designed for. And um, one particular time, we uh, we had this load of stuff, full load, and we uh, were to land on this area, and it turned out to be, it was an old glider drone where people used to learn to fly gliders in, in France. Huh? So we have about 180 kilometres uh, northeast of Colombia. Huh? Uh, as near as I can tell you about that one. Because a lot of stuff's still secret. No, no, no that is fact. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what happened was that um, we... Uh, we landed safely and we turned around and as we turned around to face to go out again we began to sink. Anyway, I said to Nobby, it was the, the skipper, I said, Nobby, I don't like this. He said, ah, you'll be all right, Bill, we'll get rid of all this rubbish, we'll be all right. So then the monkey came out of the bush, as I call it, took all the stuff away, they disappeared. And then the, the lady who was in charge of that section, she came and she says, what's troubling you? I says, I don't think we are going to get out of here. So we get the sticky bombs ready for to stick it to the aircraft and blow it up. And she said, uh, I'll see if I can get the villagers or something. Push you out. Huh? Just like that. Anyway. She went back to the village. Now normally we were on the ground about 15, 20 minutes at the most. Because anything after that was dangerous. Huh? Anyway, she went down and she got the villagers up. The village was quite a way away, but anyway, I don't ask too many questions about that. Up she come with the villagers, but on the way back, they met, met a German sergeant who was in charge of the village. And he turned around and said to him, 
Now, all you people, you'll be in trouble. You're out here, and it's after curfew. you, you're supposed to be in the villages. And of course, the idea was that she turned around and she said to them, but the, you big black aircraft is stuck in the mud, and we've got to push it out. And the Gestapo says, if we don't push it out, they're going to shoot us all and you. So he says, I'll go and look after the village. You go and push the aircraft out. So in the end, they got us out. We didn't need to blow it up. By the middle of 1943, the tide of the war had clearly turned against the Axis powers. In North Africa, after almost three years of desert warfare, the Western Allies had defeated the German and Italian armies and would invade Italy itself later in the year. Even worse for Hitler, German forces on the Eastern Front had suffered disastrous defeats at the battles of Stalingrad and Kursk, and the Russians had begun to launch a series of offensives that would eventually recapture their lost territory. Meanwhile, American bombers stationed in Britain had been pursuing a strategy of precision daylight attacks against facilities that were vital to the German war effort. However, despite the area bombing directive, the RAF had not completely abandoned the concept of precision attacks or of daylight raids. 44 Squadron was the first squadron to be issued with the Lancaster. And what they called the Rhodesian Squadron, it was all Rhodesians on it. So they decided to test out this Lancaster and they sent it to a, uh, on a bombing raid to Germany, right into uh, six, six Lancasters, and they sent right into Germany to bomb a, what's the target? Uh, Anyway, on the way there, the Mr. Smith jumped them, and out of six, they shot five down, and only one re only one returned. Nettleton, he got the VC. So when we was in the mess, talking to the uh, uh, air crew, the, the one crew that come back, they said, "Never no more will we do daylight low level raids because of suicide." So. Uh, in September, uh, October, yeah, October, some, uh, be f about the 15th, they said we're going to do some low level day, uh, daylight uh, flying. And we was flying over Lincoln, 19 Lancasters, that's all there was at the time, at uh, 30 or 40 feet above ground. And we wanted to say, well, surely not going to have another daylight raid, which did happen. On the 17th of uh, October, the target was the cruiser. The time, uh, the time in the air was half a uh, ten and a half hours. So you can see it was a big schlep. We went right across the North Sea, right across France at a height of about this this house, 90 Lancasters, each carrying uh, six one thousand pounders. And we flew right across France. All the French people were out waving to us and throwing us kisses and what not. We were still looking for the fighters. We never seen no fighters. We went right to La Crusoe. And the reason for the bombing of La Crusoe in daylight was that the whole factory was surrounded by workers' dwellings. And it frightened. If we bombed it at night time, there'd be a heavy uh, casualties amongst the civilians. So they decided to do it in daylight. And we went right across France, 92 of us, at uh, about 30 feet off the ground, carrying, each carrying six 1,000 pounders. Uh, what actually happened, at the briefing, we, we had to, uh, six aircraft, six Lancasters, had to break off as we reached the uh, Le Crusoe and bomb the power station just outside Le Crusoe. And on our port side was a uh, the, the bomb, the uh, dam buster, Gibson, and he took a picture of us, of our aircraft, as we was going into attack. And as we was going to attack this uh, power station, an aircraft on my 
starboard side just went straight in the deck and blew up. So there's only five of us left attacking the uh, power station, which we did attack and we flat, literally flattened it. We imagine 90 lengths daylight, no opposition. So we come back and we're very relieved that we went all the way there and all the way back and never see a night, never see a day fighter. And there must have been hundreds of them there. The uh, worst um, trip was um, on the uh, VI storage sites in, in France. Uh, this was a daylight raid and uh, the met up a gun I said there's a lake immediately above us just opened his bomb doors but before we could do anything we two had two thumps uh, one of the bombs went through the port wing and took away the port undercarriage uh, and so I uh, shut down the engine on that side um, because it was immediately behind the engine and uh, we came home on three engines and uh, Landed, uh, well, my pilot decided to land on the grass wrong way, which we did. And uh, again, no one was hurt. Were you worried the plane would crash when the. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. Oh, it came down. Our pilot was very uh, successful in landing it with a bot, did a body land, a belly landing, mm -hmm. <coughs> because of the. Uh, Lost all the hydraulics, we couldn't get the uh, other undercarriage down, couldn't use the flaps, or we just had to come in. We were quite fortunate. In May 1943, 617 Squadron launched an attack on several dams in the Ruhr Valley using specially modified bombs. Uh, I thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened. Uh, uh, but it was a very, very, very costly exercise, very costly exercise in, in the way of uh, numbers of aircraft and, and numbers of crew that were, the, that were killed. Uh, but it, it was a great puzzle to us because when the first aeroplanes arrived for the Dambuster raid, we didn't know what it was going to be, had the faintest idea, certainly didn't know what we were going to carry. But one day, you know, when an aeroplane, when a Lancaster flew over, you knew the sound of it. And invariably you didn't look up. But if you heard a strange sound, you would look up to see what, what it is. And these, air, these Lancasters came over with a strange sound, a different sound to the one we were equal. And when we looked up, we saw they had no bomb doors. And so we automatically said, oh, well, they've run out of bloody bomb doors uh, again, and they're sending them out without bomb doors. We'll, we'll have to fit them. But it was intended that, that the, the bomb, the round bomb, was the base of where the bomb doors were. They couldn't close the door. It was so low, they couldn't close the bomb doors. So they had to go without bomb doors, and this thing was streamlined to you know, comply with that. So that was the first thing we found out, that the, the, the new bombs were going to be without bomb doors. Um, and, oh, we, we were extraordinarily proud of that, extraordinarily proud of that. Um, but as I say, there, there was a massive, massive loss. Two of the dams were breached causing a flood that killed around 1,600 people and damaged or destroyed many buildings. Although it did not have a long-term impact on industrial production, the raid forced the Germans to divert considerable resources into repairing and fortifying the dams. Back in 1942, Britain had developed window a tactic for disrupting enemy radar, which involved deploying clouds of small aluminium strips over areas that their aircraft would be bombing. Ironically, Germany had developed window at the same time as Britain, 
but both sides were reluctant to use it, over fear that their enemy would copy them. In 1943, Bomber Command was finally given permission to deploy window over Germany. Well, what it was, each piece of silver paper made a blimp on their radar screen. Each piece. So you imagine millions of pieces dropping down. The whole screen was absolutely flooded. And the guns just stood still because they didn't know which, which uh, blimp to follow. There was, instead of one blimp on the screen, there was thousands of them, and they didn't. So the guns just stood like that. The searchlights stood like that. The fighters didn't know what to do. But the fighters, what they'd done, they'd put a separate radar in the fighters, night fighters, independently, and they could they could they could still attack us, which they did do. But the, the silver paper definitely helped us. Really helped us with the flak and the searchlights. They couldn't do anything, the searchlights just used to stay in the still like that. The main route was uh, through Holland, from the east coast through Holland. So if a, if a main group was going, say, across the Hague, we would go with the window south of that because the um, German fighter group were around patrolling around a pundit. So if they were sent off that way to find us with the window, they used up their fuel. So they had to come back and refuel. In the meantime, the main forces got through. Coming back was a different story, of course. As we was going into Jewsburg, we was, we was approaching Jewsburg, and some of the ones in front had already bombed Jewsburg, and it was coming back. And like in the U, they're coming back. It was about a quarter of a mile. As we was going in like that, they was coming out. And one of our aircraft had done it. Why he done it? He decided he wasn't going to bomb Jewsburg. He was going to join those that was already coming out. And as he went across from our from our flight, as he went across right across to join those that was coming out, the flak. Because we was under protection of the uh, silver paper. We was all dumping the silver paper out. And the radar couldn't do nothing about it. But he, he broke the uh, protection of the silver paper to cut, cut across to join the uh, blokes that was coming out. The flak opened up. It went one, one, two, three. The third one hit him right dead centre. Just went flat like And it was a shake. And I thought, and I thought I've seen the other night some but During the day I see it, I couldn't believe it. Just went in smithereens. Must have had his bomb load on him, must have had, yeah. Why why he cut across he might have been I don't know, but uh, it just blew up. Yeah. Window was first deployed over Hamburg in a series of raids in July nineteen forty three and proved to be highly effective at neutralizing the German defences. On the twenty seventh of July the RAF conducted their most devastating raid of the war when over 700 bombers attacked Hamburg and ignited a massive firestorm which incinerated eight square miles of the city. I like them. Well, the, the, big, the big one in Hamburg was the, was a big uh, fire raiser, but that, that happened to be that the wind conditions, everything was just right or wrong or the best which way, you, way you're looking at it. As far as we were concerned, it was right. As far as the Germans were, it was a big disaster. Because at that time, a lot of the buildings in Hamburg were wooden. Hmm. And were you surprised when you heard how successful the raid had been? No surprise, because that's what we went for. More successful it was, the, the, well, the better the it was. Hmm? We, we was dropping uh, 4,000 pound bombs. Well, you know the cookie. Blast bomb is a blast bomb. It dropped. As it hit the ground, it exploded. The reason for it was to blow the roofs off the houses so the incendiaries could add an easy entrance into the building, which, which did happen, as well as such huge fires. 
the roofs come off, then we dropped in cinders, and they went right through the buildings. It was a terrible war. Germans suffered terrible. How many women and children were killed, I do not know. Over a period of eight days, the Allies dropped 9,000 tons of bombs on Hamburg, which destroyed around 200,000 homes, killed over 42,000 people, wounded another 37,000, and caused more than a million to flee the city. Hamburg's manufacturing facilities were also severely affected, with most industry never achieving full production again. By the end of July, Allied raids on the Ruhr Valley had significantly damaged Germany's war economy by leaving armaments factories short of steel and aircraft manufacturers without key components. In November, Harris launched a major bombing campaign against Berlin, believing that destroying the city would end the war. But Harris's plan failed, and Berlin's powerful defences inflicted heavy losses on the Allied bombers. And how was morale in general in the Air Force? It was alright, yeah, it's alright, yeah. No, 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 no one ever moaned. They knew that they, most of them knew they wasn't going to come back. That's, that's the most amazing thing of the war, I think. They all knew, most of them knew they wasn't going to come back, which is incredible. Incredible. And to prove that, everybody used to write a last letter. I never, but most of them did, used to write the last letter home. And they knew they wasn't going to survive. You had to do 30 trips, and what if one is them doing? and come back every time. When it's some day. Morale didn't come into it. As I said, we're all volunteers. We knew what we were in for. So, we used to go drinking together as a crew when we had nights off. Each one bought a round of half a pint. So that's three and a half pints twice, seven pints, so we used to roll back, go to somebody else's aircraft and get a wick of their oxygen and go back to bed. You have to remember that um, some of the pilots, when they arrive, are novice pilots. You know, when they arrive on a squadron for the first time, they, they've had their training, they've had good training from small aircraft to a large aircraft. But when they get onto a squadron with the crew and the bomb load and all the rest of it, um, it, it, it it's a, a little bit of a different story until you've been through it several times. So I've seen lots of airplanes uh, crash on landing for no apparent reason. Uh, one night, uh, an air, bearing in mind we landed on grass, um, uh, one airplane for reasons unknown, I don't know why, but it overshot the perimeter fence and went into a field that belonged to a farmer further along. And this airplane unfortunately ran into about 20 heifers, uh, cows, massive cows. And, uh, and when we got there, you couldn't tell humans from animals and that was the most horrible thing I have ever experienced in my life. Um, we, 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 we didn't have to touch them, the medical crew did that, but to see this mixture of uh, animals and humans was uh, <coughs> something that I'm very, very reluctant to talk about at any time because it's uh, very distressing. Because Wellington was LT Operation Training Unit and we used to have in it the G for navigation. I know you, I used to pop out and help the navigator, Arthur, used to, I used to do the G and everything else. And um, we lost the G and got lost and we were in cloud and uh, the aircraft started to vibrate violently. So we had a discussion whether we should pop out or not. 
because uh, we didn't know where we were. Anyway, we decided to leave, and when we got back to base, um, we went to the hangar, and the, the chief engineer said, said to us, you had one minute before the port engine blew up. What well, during the early days, sometime our planes were not 100% to be airworthy, but we could not always make complaints because if we complain sometime for some small what it was defect, we've been probably treated as we not happy to continue our responsible mission. Yeah. You see from in early days sometime playing because it was such a big demand in continued training and the plane probably didn't receive 100% service capable under the pressure, but we did fly them because it was such a situation what we had not enough time to keep the play in a hundred, hundred percent. And planes were under continuous, very big pressure and small repairs and defects needed to be done. It was not to blame the people who serviced the plane, but it was only because it was in such a hurry time what we had to do everything in short time. There were no days off. Um, on a bomber command station, in my five group, we worked seven days a week from eight to five, eight to, eight to five, and every third day you did a 24 hour shift because during the day we worked on the aeroplanes and prepared them for night raids when, when they were. Uh, and then a skeleton crew of about four or five would carry on after six o'clock through the night to see the airplane off or see them back or both um, and then refuel them, um, prepare any damage, repair any damage, slight damages. Uh, large damages went to the hangar but the, the small damage was done out in the, in the open on the airfield um, and we would finish at um, four, five, six o'clock in the morning, depending on what, what time they, they got back. And when we were finished, we went off to bed. And uh, you then had the rest of that day off. So uh, I would normally sleep till midday uh, and then go into Lincoln or one of the local villages just to have a, a bite to eat and uh, a drink. Most of the boys used to go for a drink, but I used to go for some food first. I had great problems with coping with the food. It was uh, very poor, very poor. I, I had a funny do. I, I, I had a, an Australian uh, soldier's knife, which was an enormous knife. And one of my friends who was, who was bombing, uh, they, had, they, they had to drop uh, leaflets. Uh, and these leaflets all came tied with a piece of string, you see, uh, uh, and uh, uh, they had to cut this string. And he borrowed this great big knife of mine, and he he he, he was dropping leaflets, and, and he dropped the knife. And he worried for weeks if he did hit somebody. He he dropped 
£14,000 pounds of bombs, but he was more worried about this big Australian, Australian soldier's knife if it had done any damage. We had training to drop leaflets, propaganda leaflets over Vichy France to promise French people what liberation will be coming for them in near future. During my return from such a mission, our Wellington bomber received defect and we crash landed before we reached the aerodrome. During that impact in the crash, I lost consciousness. When I recover my consciousness, I knew what I must try to get out of my crash play. Instead of looking for exit, I went to save the pilot, hoping that he's still alive. I don't know if he was still alive or he was half dead, but I couldn't take him from his seat because I think he was still tied up with the belt, yes. I could not see it because, you know, I had to cover my face with my hand because the flame was all over it. Plane was in golf in the fire. And when I found that exit, broken exit, I was already, my combination was burning. And the people who came, because we'd been near the aerodrome, and those people were professional because they always been expecting what sooner or later some crashes do happen. You know what I mean, when they live close by. They had courage to come quite close and help to undo my burning, you know, flying suit. Yes. But uh, I was already then, uh, my helmet was thrown out, you see, during the impact, and I was already, the, all my hair, my head was badly burned, and my hands up to, up to here, you see. It must have been very difficult if you, you went one night and you, you came back and some of your mates didn't, and you knew you would have to go again the next night, and the next night, and the next night. And uh, it's a mental strain as much as anything, I think. I always, always admire them for what they did, because I know it, an ordinary foot soldier, that, well, I was Royal Artillery, so I had big guns, but I knew that um, at least we got some rest time, you didn't know what was coming, but they knew what was coming, and they had to do it every night. Were, were there any other times where someone refused to go on a bombing raid? Well, the only contact I anything like that is our first navigator, who was married, and he couldn't take it anymore. And in those days, they called it lack of moral fibre. Today you go and see a psychiatrist and you're just whipped away, away, demoted, take to place like Christchurch or something like that, and demoted and, you, and they treat you like dirt, whereas it's a mental condition. I mean, you, they just, 
didn't want anybody contaminated. So we had to have a new navigator. A bomb aimer. He was, sorry, he was a bomb aimer. A new bomb aimer. Well, personally speaking, I think they should have done a psychotic, psychotic hospital and we'd find out exactly what was wrong with them. There was definitely... A lot of them couldn't help it. I'm telling you, the, 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 the bombing raids were horrendous. I'm telling you, they, it was absolutely frightening. And some, as you know, not everybody can take it. A few of them couldn't take it. And what they done was stripped them down and put them in prison, which is all wrong. LMS, they called it. And after, when they come out of prison, they put great big stamp on their record papers, LMF. And the whole station where they were posted to knew what he was. But they couldn't help it. They couldn't help it. It's a shame. In spring 1944, Bomber Command and the American 8th Air Force were ordered to reduce their attacks on Germany and instead focus on targets in France to support the upcoming invasion. In June, the Western Allies landed their troops on the beaches of Normandy and after several months of fighting, most of France had been liberated. The Germans had retreated, obviously, and they'd left their death dead behind on the roadside at the time. And I remember a, a French woman, and she came out from a, a normal village nearby, I think, and she had high-heeled shoes on, and this German, dead German, was lying on, on the grass at the side of the road, and she deliberately went over and ground the heel into his dead face and the sheer hatred. And I thought, who am I to... How do you know what she's been through, or her village has been through, or what her father's been through? And uh, it's a case of re what she was so... But, I mean, he never felt anything anyway, but it was something that made me feel sick. Meanwhile, Hitler's armies had been driven out of the Soviet Union and would eventually lose control of Eastern Europe. However, as the Red Army drove back the Germans, they committed numerous atrocities against the populations they encountered, and soon it became clear that Stalin wanted to bring these countries under Soviet domination. The Russians was already made big European power. Stalin demanded very big concession in Europe. That's why lots of Eastern European countries, instead of being free, they been given to the Russian domination, Russian exploitation for more than 40 years after the war. Anyway, after the invasion, uh, we thought we'd be home the following day, but it didn't work out that way. But we wondered what would happen to us, because whether we'd be held as hostages, whether we were shot like the 50, and then in January, uh, we uh, had a kind of prior warning uh, on the Great Line that we would be moved. Well, the Russians were only 20 miles away. We could hear the guns, uh, and we were hoping that the Russians would overtake us. With hindsight, that would have been disastrous. But anyway, uh, suddenly, we were told we were on the road, we were going to be uh, marched out and we left the camp at about two o'clock in the morning. I'd made a sledge like that there, uh, and in fact there's a copy of the memorial. Uh, the uh, Germans had made no provision for food or accommodation on route. We were not equipped for that sort of thing. The temperature was minus 30 degrees centigrade. It was the coldest winter in Polish living memory, and there's been confirmed since. And uh, there was a blizzard. It wasn't a march, it was a trudge. People often say, do you recognize this 
when you pass. All I recognise is the, the person's feet in front of me, you know, sloshing along. And it was, I say, 36 hours before we got shelter. We were put into a barn. Those that didn't get in got frostbite. Those that took their boots off had difficulty putting them on again because they were frozen. We got up the next morning. No provision had been made for anything. And then we marched. And, and this went on two or three days. We were informed we going to travel by train for a while, but we had another small march. But once we got on the train, or on the train, it was a trucks, like good trucks. And there were 65 of us in one truck, which in normal uh, circumstances would have, been, would have been a bit crowded, to say the least. But it wasn't long before people wanted to relieve themselves. Of course, you couldn't open the door, that was a lot from the outside. There's a crack in the door and various chaps stood at the door trying to relieve themselves, but in the end a corner was used to, they wanted to do number twos as they thought, call it, you know, and eventually, no, it was, oh, I don't know how to describe it, the stench was terrific, but every, everybody was wanting to relieve themselves and it was in the corner, and of course that meant pictures were getting closer and closer together, because during a couple of days before we uh, got on the train, we'd been at a farmhouse and somebody found a tub of what they said was molasses. Of course, everyone being hungry and thirsty, and they put the mugs in and had some of this molasses, but it was far, what they called farm molasses. And of course, Canadians used to love uh, molasses, similar to treacle in our case, you know. But it, this would turn out to be farm molasses, which they used to use to, uh, to make silage for the cattle. And dysentery set, set in with nearly everyone on the, on the train. And believe me, it was no, no holiday sitting in that train. We did uh, finally stop, and then we were allowed out, out of the trucks, and some of us got out, well, I think most people got out, but a lot of us couldn't get back in on our own, it was on a slope, and it wasn't on, it was out in the country, so there was no platform, and we went down the slope and done what we had to, and got back up the hit slope to uh, get in and the Germans were actually helping us into the trucks, the guards, and some of our own chaps who was a bit fitter, helped each other up. By February 1945, the Allied armies had begun to invade Germany itself, and Britain's air ministry believed that they could shorten the war by attacking major cities near the Eastern Front to restrict the movement of Hitler's troops. Consequently, between the 13th and 15th of February, American and British bombers conducted several major attacks on the German city of Dresden. Well, Dresden, we were briefed to uh, bomb the railway sidings where uh, there were supposed to be a lot of uh, German concentrations ready to go to the uh, Eastern Front, uh, which was what we did. Um, didn't really know at the time how uh, the uh, town was uh, devastated. We, we never actually bombed Dresden. We, we bombed the place just outside Dresden called Bohulem, or Holem, or Bohulem, I don't know, B-O-H-L-E-N. <coughs> we was told to uh, go in before the, uh, the five, we was in four group then, 
and was told to go in just before fire group and draw the fighters away from Dresden, <coughs> which we did do. We was bleating swarms of bleating fighters around us and the lengths went into Dresden unopposed and that's why Dresden took such a hiding. There was no opposition whatsoever there and the fire group just done what they liked. And we could see, well, we were right next door there, we could see the huge blaze of Dresden burning merrily away. Nearly 4,000 tons of bombs were dropped on Dresden during these raids, which triggered a firestorm that killed around 25,000 people and destroyed a large portion of the city. But if you take Dresden with Stalin, who was advancing, Dresden was no longer an open city. Before that, they were making gun sites as well. They had a big industry in gun, obstetrics and opticians and women. But Stalin said to Truman at that time and Churchill that Dresden, the troops, German troops are massing near Dresden and I want them seen to. I want them cleared. So both the Americans and us, they are bombed Dresden. Dresden was unfortunate, but there were 25,000 casualties. Goebbels put another note on the end, it made 250,000, right? But Dresden was needed because Stalin wanted it. It was in the way of his troops to get into East Germany. So no matter what anybody said about Dresden, I'd always say, Dresden was needed, unfortunate. You tell me about Coventry. You tell me about Rotterdam. You tell me about Bristol, Southampton, Bristol. You tell me about those cities. Don't tell me, don't talk to me about Dresden. At Spremberg, we were loaded into cattle trucks. Uh, I think 50 or something like in a cattle truck. There was no room to stretch out. Uh, most of us had dysentery. We had one bucket between us, and so you can imagine the stench, but at least it was on sweet. Then uh, um, the, uh, we, we were on there for several days. We were parked up overnight, uh, and we often wondered whether we'd be a victim to our own bombing, but you know, we often heard the bombs and the thing. Eventually, we came to a, a, a place near Bremen and uh, got the Tarmstadt, and we were pushed up, and then had to walk to about six, uh, six hours or something to a, a camp. And they Search, it was raining or snowing, it was cold. They seemed to search every one of us. And when we got into the uh, camp, it had been wrecked completely. Uh, it had been a, a camp for mariners, uh, either Navy or Merchant Navy. Um, they had wrecked the joint completely. They'd broken the windows, burnt the bed boards smashed the stoves, all we had was wet straw. And the reason they did that, the USA, our own people, uh, was they thought they were evacuating the camp to make way for refugees from Hamburg and Bremen, of course, little bit. We stayed there, I don't know how many, probably a month or something. Uh, and one, I remember spending a whole morning on my haunches, uh, going on the cinder path, picking up little bits of coke, you know, about eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch, to to fill a, a can, to to so that we make a, a reasonable brew. Um, one on one occasion, uh, we saw or heard, knew that there was a bread wagon coming, and we were obviously uh, quite excited. The trouble was, a tempest or a typhoon shot it up near, and it's near the camp. If that aircraft had come down, we would have lynched him. He was one of our own. Anyway, after a time, we were then on the road again, but this time we were living out uh, all, all the time. We were sleeping in fields, 
at night we put our, our towels to show POW for our own aircraft. Uh, I mean, escape would have been easy, but or apart from it being for Britain, but it would have been easy. But then you've got to go through the uh, German lines and the British lines, you're just like, like be shot by either of them. The following day, I was with Cooperman and we were bombing a place called Worms in the Ruhr Valley. And I always remember to this day, this uh, Canadian, there was a Jew, there was a Jewish bloke, and he had left Germany with his parents before the war. And uh, he, was a, he was a flying officer in the Canadian Air Force. And as we approached Worms, he said, Chaps, he said, this is where I was born. He said, now I'm going to bomb the bastards. On the 13th of April was another time we went to Kiel. And what had happened was the night before we went to Kiel, and we um, put this battleship and we sunk it, we turned it over. And then the, it came back that they wanted us to go back again. And one of the retorts was that night from one of the crews was, are you sure you don't want us to put it back up again? <laughs> but so that, that was it. And that, that actually blocked the canal. When we went on, we were supposed to be going into a camp at Lubeck, but... Um, the uh, uh, there was typhoid or typhus in the camp uh, in in Lubeck, and so there was a lot of negotiation. We were dumped on a farm outside Lubeck, once again living out in the open and sort of just uh, making shelters for ourselves. I remember there was a lake there. The German the twenty first Army Group. Eventually crossed the the, the air hub and caught up with it. But before that, uh, uh, reconnaissance vehicle, one of these little things, and you don't know whether it's going forward or back, with two men in it, usually an officer and an NCO, came into the camp and we mobbed him. I mean, we really mobbed him. And uh, uh, I don't think he was the advanced party of the. I, I've got an idea he lost his way. But anyway, eventually, the main body of the troops came up and we were told to wait there until uh, uh, the, main, uh, the main force came up and then uh, they would give us transport to Brussels where we'd be flown back to England. We woke up and then, no, it must have been about the 22nd, discovered that the German guards had gone and a, a senior, I think it was a Norwegian officer, had been put in charge of the camp and he gave instructions no one to leave as the Russians were very close and on the 23rd uh, these Russian tanks arrived and it was a sight never forget they, these tanks went straight down the main road, I suppose you'd call it, of the camp, the barbed wire either side, knocking it down. Everybody was cheering, I remember. And they turned round, the tanks did, and come back up. And with the tanks on some of the tanks were Russian prisoners that was in a compound further down, uh, sitting on the tanks, and some were walking, and it was said that they were continuing with the troops to Berlin. Uh, they were in a sad state, I must admit. And uh, the ne next thing, another uh, follow-up troops, as they moved off further on, the second wave of Russian troops come, which had women in them, amongst them as well. And we were treated just like prisoners as well by them. So uh, what did the German towns look like you went through? I mean, were they heavily bombed? 
Uh, the little place of Sell. See, you great and I have been there since. And it's a, a really old fashioned town, but it was the uh, centre of the Wehrmarks gas production area. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was a lovely moonlight day, we were all on tanks. The drive through to sail us and the 15th Scottish Lowland Division. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found out there was no opposition. It's at the Wehrmacht had pulled out and we drove straight through. And apparently, if we hadn't taken it, they were going to bomb the daylights out of it the following day. But we went straight through there. People often say that, you know, it was the end of the war. No one knew it was the end, near the end of the war. And, uh, and the Germans were still raining V2 rockets on England, whether it was near the end of the war or not. Having seen the results of that in, after the invasion, well, we went into Germany and into the cities, and I realised what a lethal thing that the RAF did. I mean, God knows they paid for it in casualties, and I don't think we can underestimate the what they did, both both as fighters here, the fighter planes and the Battle of Britain and uh, the Bomber Command, some of the cities were like a desert and it, they had to bulldoze roads out of the rubble. It was incredible, it was look at, you'd look out into a mound of the bricks and that smashed and also uh, in Hamburg particularly uh, they got a right hammering and there's a, a lake in Hamburg called the Ulster there's no doubt you know and um, we as Hamburg was one of the cities that we didn't so much high explosive we firebombed and literally well, people were flying and throwing themselves into the water, into the Ulster, rather than being burnt. And, you know, oh, I know both sides did nasty things, but, you know, I've always thought about that, so, you know. And, and of course, being, going into Hamburg afterwards, I mean, it was... I don't know where the people lived, in holes in the ground or what, but uh, they were, they were, a lot of the town was just obliterated. But despite the immense devastation, the German war effort did not collapse, and industrial production increased until the end of 1944. However, the bombing campaign had forced the Nazis to commit around a million troops and tens of thousands of flat guns to anti-aircraft defence instead of frontline service. In total, over 80,000 personnel from the Allied Air Forces had died during this aerial offensive, whilst hundreds of thousands of civilians had been killed across Europe. As the Allies advanced further into Germany, they began to uncover the full horrors of the Nazi regime. In the 1930s, Hitler's government had advocated hatred against the Jews and others whom they saw as inferior. But, during the war, this oppression had escalated into mass killings when the Nazis launched an extermination program against those whom they saw as a threat to the Aryan race. We knew what in Germany before the war anti-Semitism started to increase. So I did believe in Holocaust during the war because I started somehow getting information from Poland what's happening not only to the Jewish people 
and to the Polish people. And we had sympathy, we Poles had sympathy for the Jewish people and Polish people uh, uh, in reverse, you see. So I didn't, from beginning, never thought of gas chambers when they start to modernize such a barbaric destruction. But uh, we dropped millions of leaflets uh, and what I, I, I knew about the, uh, the, 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 the they were killing the Jews uh, they can't, the German people can't say they didn't know because the, all the leaflets uh, had photographs of piles of dead people and things uh, w w w which were dropped over there. I read after the war that the Jewish uh, community in England asked us, asked Bomber Harris to bomb Auschwitz, bomb it completely. And he refused. Good job he did, because can you imagine what happened after the war? And they found out that the RF had bombed a, a concentration camp. The thing was, the Jews reckoned that uh, it was better for them to be killed with a bomb than the, the suffering like they were. In total, around 11 million people died in this Holocaust. Six million Jews, two and a half million Russian prisoners of war, two million Poles, and hundreds of thousands of Romani. Race was not the only factor behind the extermination. Over 300,000 people were killed because of their sexuality, their religion, their disabilities, or their political allegiance. How, how did you feel when you heard about the Holocaust? Well, I knew about that from Belson. Mm -hmm. I knew about that because I saw it. And as I say, if ever I had any doubts about the war and what an evil regime Germans had, that was it when I saw that. I was only there three hours, if it was three hours, but uh, believe you me, what you saw in the newsreels was absolutely there. Heaps of bodies, starvation. No, it was awful. Awful. And that uh, Kramer was in, in Monaco's while I was there. And he looked an arrogant so and so, the commandant behind him. So, what, what was it like in Belst? I mean, were there awful, were there... awful? The smell was atrocious. They were dying from typhus and all the diseases that associated with it, starvation, mold. Mund... I mean, six hundred a week were dying after it was liberated. You know, they they couldn't save them. But the, the heaps of bodies lying on the, uh, in the open and the stench was all, I don't know. I felt sorry for the blokes who were having the deal with it. We pulled out and went back to our units because we were still advancing up towards Wiesmar. Do you think the war was worth the price? It had to be, yeah, after Belson, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it had to be done. They were an evil regime. And uh, God knows what would have happened to us eventually if we'd made peace with them and even joined with them. Sooner or later, that megalomaniac would have uh, had his Gestapo what nuts turn on us because they'd lists drawn up of who to execute from England, didn't they? Yeah. Whole lists of people, yeah. all the Jewish community, yeah. that already decided they were all going to the gas chambers. By late April 1945, most of Germany had fallen to the Allies and Berlin was encircled by the Red Army. However, although the war would soon be over, there was still one more major operation for the Allied bomber crews and it would take place over Holland. Queen Juliana and Prince Bernhard were here um, in England, in the UK, in exile. And in January 1944, she called the railway workers to go on strike in Holland. With this Nazi 
Reich Baalstar, was so incensed that he stopped all food coming into Western Holland from the agriculture part of Holland itself. So out of 3,900,000, 3, eventually 20,000 died of starvation and malnutrition was rife. People were starving. Andrew Geddes ran away with others to tactical air force and he devised a plan for dropping food in certain areas in Western Holland by air, incorporating squadrons of Lancasters and also pathfinders. And he got hold of this Nazi, really, and in a school, they met a school called Undervet, and he explained the plan, and the, the Germans didn't like it. He said, not the case of you liking it, it's what we're going to do. And if you interfere in any way, what we're going to do, you'll be arrested as a war criminal. We we'll go forward this day and we, we thought, well, well, this is another rob. And this was on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were told that we are, we we're going to have stuff loaded on and we are to drop it. But it wasn't bombs. It was in our containers, the containers that type that we used at, uh, for dropping the stuff into the, into the Maquis as well, where we used to drop stuff. And uh, so that, that was all right. And when we got in there, of course, we, we didn't know the whole story, but um, it's like a very good friend of mine says, uh, her, her grandmother told her to hide under the table because she thought that was missions that were going to come and do some bombing around about there. Instead of that, of course, we, we were dropping the food. On April 29th, 28th it started, but the weather was too bad. So on the 29th of April, Operation Manor started without the agreement being signed until the next day. And quite legally, they, they could have been shot down. They would go in at 300 feet, 100 metres, something like that, within a designated area. If anybody went outside that area, They'd be worn by red flares and shot at and shot down. But anyway, so it went off without it, um, incident and um, that was the start of Manor. And it went from April the 29th to May the 8th. The Americans came in, they called it Chowham the next day and they finished on May the 7th. So in the total there was 12,000 12, tonnes of food dropped overall. The RAF dropped 7,000 and the Yanks dropped 4,000. And of course the Germans were advised that their anti-aircraft guns wouldn't be firing at us. But they forgot to tell a lot of people with a rifle that what was happening. <coughs> so it wasn't impossible for us to get a few pot shots aimed at us with, with people on the ground with rifle fire. But anyway, we landed. We we didn't land, of course. We just went in and we dropped it, and certain food drops, and that was it. But later on, the second, the third day, uh, by that time they got a bit organised, and um, we were dropping food into into football grounds. Um, and what had happened? They got the local people to put big white crosses on the football grounds. And that's where we had to drop into. And one of the one of the trips that we were doing was that uh, we were flying in, and um, and this other Lancaster, and we said, "Oh, a sprog crew," <laughs> and his came to come across us, and we had to veer quickly, and let him come in. Well, we went in very, I think, about two or three thousand feet, and dropped to three hundred. And when we got over to Holland, um, my first, I, I'm, I'm the last to see anything because I'm at the back, right? There's this boy 
on his bicycle on top of a dike, which flooded all round, astride his bicycle, waving a Union Jack and a Dutch tricolour, right? And we were flying in just below the roof of a hospital. We were all waving sheets and God knows what else. And we went be between The Hague and Rotterdam to drop at Ippenburg and straight out again. But we could see people waving. They were warned to keep away. One guy was apparently rushed onto the dropping field, got hit by a sack of potatoes, and that killed him. When we were dropping our stuff, one of them went outside and landed on the railway line. Anyway, uh, I could see lots of people around about it, because it would take them quite a while to try and get into it, of course. But by this time they realised it was, it was food that was on them, not bombs. And to do this day, in Holland, is taught in, as history, the survivors. And when we've been back there before, um, we've been invited back. As I say, in 1981, we went, we went in 1982 on that first trip. We were overwhelmed. We didn't realise. People used to come up to us and still do when we go there. Thank you for saving my life. Thank you for saving my parents' life. Children are growing. It's very touching. On the 30th of April, with his regime collapsing around him, Hitler committed suicide in his bunker beneath Berlin. On the 8th of May, Germany surrendered unconditionally to the Allies. However, for a long time after the war, many people refused to acknowledge the role that Bomber Commander played in defeating the Nazis. The, 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 government, the government will not accept what Bomber Command done. That's why we're in so much trouble. They're embarrassed. They was embarrassed with Bomber Command. And yet they told us to go there. It wasn't us. It was the government that told us to go. Well, they told Harris what they'd do anyway. You see, they, they always blamed us for all kinds of things, Bomber Command. And uh, it, it was all quite wrong what, uh, what was done. Uh, they go on about certain certain places were bombed and this and that but uh, they, they didn't talk about Coventry and London and uh, all, all the stuff in, in uh, Holland that was bombed and everywhere. Why do you think Bomber Command were treated the way they were? That I don't know. That I do not know. I, ne I can never understand it and I never will. We won the war. We definitely won the war for Bomber, for Britain. When our losses were horrendous, and yet that after the war they absolutely on us. Yeah, I think it was terrible. They treated us terrible. I think Churchill made a, a, quite an error of judgment. Something must have happened at some time between Harris and Churchill, or Harris and some minister. Which, which turned Churchill. And I think Churchill regretted it for the rest of his days, although I don't think he ever said so publicly. He said one or two things, but he didn't say fully publicly that uh, he um, regretted saying it. Uh, but... Um, I was annoyed that uh, a bomber command was not recognised for what it did, and it did a hell of a lot for Britain during the time when the army was uh, years. The army was inactive you know, until uh, D Day. Uh, we, well, I mean, we were the only uh, enemy that the the, 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 the the enemy knew about. Um, and I, I was very annoyed that Bomber Command was not recognised with a special uh, award uh, and that um, we who served in Bomber Command never had one single badge 
to show that we were Baba Command. They were not treated fairly. It was completely unfair. As far as I'm concerned, even even it took it took for recognition and it took over seventy years. Now on my my medal bar I've got the thirty nine forty five star. But also I wear it in a little brass mounting which it says Bomber Command, you know. And it took seventy years for them to give it give it to us. And how do you feel today about your wartime service? No, that all I know is I killed many, 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 many people. But I uh, saw I went to Altswitz and that changed my view. Before I had a guilty conscience of it because I knew I'd, I'd killed many, many people. But when I went to Altswitz and see what was going on myself, that was it. Finished. The way I look at it is that um, it's not a, not a thing we brag about. You know? It's um, it was wartime, and that was it. And today I've got I've got many friends across Europe, and across Africa. That um, and they come from all sorts of walks of life, and all different countries. Bye.